Hello and welcome to another edition of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. Um, hi, Marina, how are Hello. you? Hello, I'm very well, Richard. How are you? I'm really well. You've been working incredibly hard all week on your um, huge American show, which we're not yet allowed to talk about. I'm filming it. It, 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 is, it is shooting currently and we yeah. shall... And that's all we can say. <laughs> that's all we're allowed very to say. secretive. Saudi Arabia has put lots of money into sort of buying sports. To you know, they bought Newcastle, they've bought the golf, they've bought all sorts of different things. Obviously, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, the effective ruler Mohammed bin Salman, for a while famous for the murder of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who went into a um, Istanbul embassy to get a marriage license and was murdered and dismembered within that embassy. Now. He was the international persona non grata. No one's going to work with him. Um, even on a sort of funny entertainment level, Gerard Butler said, I will not do my visit to Saudi Arabia. I'll not film anything there. Needless to say, Kandahar, which is a, the first film to be shot entirely in Saudi Arabia, stars Gerard Butler as a CIA operative, I think, who has to fight his way out of Afghanistan. The plot details are irrelevant. I'll believe anything with Gerard in it. World's leading yeah. meteorologist. Yes, I'll believe it. I'll watch it. Get down. Mohammed bin Salman wants to put a lot of money into cultural projects, Western cultural projects. He's started a big Red Sea film fund. He started a Red Sea film festival, which has drawn lots and lots of big names. We'll come to those in a minute. And there was a very interesting, sort of funny, awful Vanity Fair article about his bromance with Johnny Depp. Um, and Johnny Depp um, has spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia. He's given sort of various... It almost sounds like sort of hostage video quotes, but they are about how exciting he is about the emergence of new storytelling in Saudi Arabia. You know, he's listened to all the excuses about the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and seems to have believed some of them. But if you're asking how Johnny Depp got into this, it's quite interesting. How and did it tells, Johnny Depp get into it, this? It tells us a lot about film financing and whatever. You know, when you go to the cinema and you sit down and the titles start and it will say Canal Plus, yes. you know, the Lower Saxony Lottery Fund, the Slovenian Cultural Heritage thing. And you get all these cards starting at the in the titles before you even get to the main titles of the film. And you're like, God, how long? Oh, here we go. So, UNESCO. All of these things. Now, someone has had to stitch together all those little pieces of funding and it is incredibly difficult and it is very, very hard to find the money to make films at all. So essentially, when you look at those things at the start of a film, some of those are the people who are producing the film, and some of those are just sums of money that made up... You had to make $20 million, and you had $15 and million, and you start... Really, yeah, really hard, hard, and it can fall away even while you're shooting. Now, while Johnny Depp was shooting some French movie, Jeanne du Barry... He is told by the film's producers he needs to meet this guy, Prince Bada of Saudi Arabia, who's a sort of cultural bag carrier, as far as I can work out, for MBS, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, and he says, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't have to do that. And they are like, well, I think you do really have to do that because I think our financing is going to fall away if you don't do it. Anyway, he meets this guy. One thing leads to another. Soon he's having all expenses paid trips to Saudi Arabia. He really likes this guy. And as Vanity Fair article put it, which I found right, slightly hilarious, about his bromance with MBS, both men knew how it suddenly felt to go from golden boy to outcast. <laughs> Wow. It's like, oh, yeah. you just you dismember one guy. Yeah. I, it's really hard. <laughs> As for the Johnny Depp, um, I know there are a lot of Johnny Depp fans out there. there. It's incredible. Online, if you write about anything to do with Johnny Depp, there are a huge number of single-issue human beings whose single issue is Johnny Depp's ex-wife was horrid to him and they will work online day and night to defend Johnny Depp in this. However, what a lot of people are saying now, there's an interesting Tortoise podcast about it now, that lots of stuff that came up in Johnny Depp's trial with his ex-wife Amber Heard were bot accounts paid for by Saudi Arabia to sort of act on behalf of Johnny Depp online. Really? Yeah, and so th there is a huge sort of... I mean, this is what he can give you, apart from chump change to make your ridiculous movies about French courtesans. He can give you all these sorts of things. Well, they say he's, although he's not the richest man in the world, he has the most spare cash of anyone yeah. in the world, MBS Mohammed bin Salman. He can literally, if you're looking for someone to give you money, don't go to Musk, don't go to Bill Gates. MBS has the most money of anyone in the world that he could just give you out of his pocket tomorrow. And it gives him great pleasure to sort of buy these Things, you know, you like as football fans often say, you can't buy 200 years of history. It's like, well, you can, can't you? Because they just have. Yeah, exactly. And oh, you by can't... the way, we are sponsored this week by Visit Jeddah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, and, not, we're not for sale. 
I suppose to some extent there have always been, um, I was talking to a very, uh, these, these kind of bromances between dictators and actors. They're both in the entourages game. They are both not used to hearing the no word no very often. And there's some something about the cachet of each. Someone very eminent in the media was telling me uh, that he once had lunch in um, Havana with Fidel Castro. And as the wine was being bought, Castro said, all of this is from my friend Gerald Depardieu, my best friend. Now he's been cancelled in France, Depardieu, which is incredibly hard. I mean, perhaps the hardest country in the world to get cancelled. Well, <laughs> second hardest since we're talking about Saudi Arabia. And he's now doing it, I guess, with Putin. He's now probably Putin's best friend and sending his wines to Putin. Who it's knows? like Stephen Seagal and um, Kim Jong-un. Yeah, and all and that kind of Stephen stuff. Stephen Seagal and any dictator. It is it is fascinating. There's a sort of infantile playground attraction between incredibly rich billionaires and incredibly vain actors. Yeah. There's something thing that each is missing the other because I I guess the billionaires all they want to do is be liked uh, and I guess actors because they're paid millions the only thing left for them is to be paid billions and so there's 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 like a symbiotic relationship there is something there and having said that it's this Red Sea Film Festival that has been going for a few years um not very many um of course I'll tell you who who went out there Will Smith. So we're talking about the semi-cancelled men. But Will Smith went out there and he was paid, uh, I think people say he was paid a million dollars. What is exciting you about being here? What are you looking forward to? You know, uh, Saudi Arabia has a really um, unique opportunity with the... the. But you know, Guy Ritchie went out there. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow went out there. What people understand, apparently what the big agents are saying, I've talked to some agents about this, they're saying, yeah, people know that if you go to Saudi Arabia, you get paid. So you are paid mm. essentially to appear in the country it's like a PA but in the country yeah which is what they've done with golf yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you literally just have to turn up with a with a bag of clubs and then uh, and you get money <laughs> so we're very very um familiar with sports washing and what Saudi yeah. Arabia are doing that and trying to sort of have that soft cultural power of you know extending the brand of Saudi Arabia uh, they seem to be enormously successful in that live golf is going from strength to strength yeah. and I think Saudi Arabian money is staying in golf forever now they are putting money into other sports but they are now deliberately targeting uh, the movies and television. And they've in, built in a... extraordinary studios there. I mean, really amazing studios that people have to come and see and then they're told they'll not have to pay any tax. And it's, mm. you know, they they will do anything to get you into the country. And Baz, yeah, Baz Luhrmann went to visit the studios recently and he was very impressed. I bet he was. Baz Luhrmann. But, you know, it's hard even for Baz Luhrmann to get films made in Hollywood well, currently that's... because... That's that's what's happened. This kind of mid-level, as we've said, in, across lots of different disciplines, mid-budget things have fallen away. So you've got these massive kind of tentpole things that the studio are doing. But if you want to make a sort of $80, $80 million film, which is mid-budget, basically, it, it's it's much, much harder. And this is where people like this come in and will pay for things. Well, that's it. So sport always had a money issue, always needed sponsors. And those sponsors it used to be... If you want to know what the greatest vice is in uh, any country at any given time, look at who sponsors sports. So in the <laughs> 70s and 80s, it was all cigarettes. It yeah. was the Embassy World Championship. Um, then it was booze, you know, you've got the Carling Cup and things like that. Now it is betting and crypto. So essentially... McDonald's. McDonald's. But football's always on the lookout for money. Sports always on the yeah. lookout for money. And Saudi Arabia have money and want to soft advertise themselves. And as you say, film and TV now, TV used to be the BBC would fund your programme, ITV would fund your programme, Channel 4 would fund your programme. That's now impossible, even for the most basic shows. So you always have to get finance from other places. Why would anyone be financing film and TV at the moment? Because the money has sort of gone from that industry. Um, so, you know, it's much, much harder to find seed funding for anything. And that's a perfect opportunity for Saudi Arabia because, you know, they have got an awful lot of money. And as you say, that's why Paltrow is out there. Uh, that's why Depp is out there. Yeah, that's but how why... much money is enough? I think it's dreadful. I mean, what's she doing out there? Her company is valued at 250 million or maybe more. And she has absolutely no need to take the money there. You know, they've got a women in cinema event that they have there. It's like, I can't wow. wait to hear the Saudi Arabia view on the women in the cinema. That, that, that's, well, I wonder what that event's like. I think women are even allowed to pick a mix in the cinema. So they, someone else has to uh, pick it and mix it for them. Yes. Of course, MBS is the only person who can actually afford pick and mix at the cinema. I sometimes think I'm not a fan of cinema. I'm a fan of pick and mix. I'm never looking forward to Harrison Ford. I'm always looking forward to some fizzy strawberries. Well, there, there's actually, economically, that is actually what's happened to them. They've sort of become food courts with a kind of digital film screening thing attached. I'd watch a documentary about the pick and mix industry. 
Why isn't there been one? But who was, who's the big company behind Pick and Mix? Could you name who's it? Who's Big Pick and Mix? Yeah, but who? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know, but I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> who's big? You know what? It's probably the Saudis. It's pro- probably. They probably it took all, it over. Follow the money, Richard. Follow yeah, the money. Follow the money. Anthony Joshua was fighting out in Saudi Arabia uh, this year. Boxing, you can always tell. It's like the porn industry. Yeah. Boxing will always find the newest <laughs> the newest source of money. Uh, and, you know, boxing has really sold its soul to, uh, to to Saudi Arabia. We're at the start of something big, I believe, in, in, the, in the kingdom, especially the way the Saudis do things. It's going to be the absolute business. Just unbelievable. I mean, this is the 21st century on speed. So, you know, it's a... It's a it's an avalanche and, it, and it's, it's coming for the movie and television business as well. What's interesting is that the producers who, I mean, obviously it's always been a sort of immoral business movie making, but the producers are saying things like, there was one guy I saw who was saying, oh, the greatest power I've seen from the kingdom is their long-term thinking. They have the ability to think in five or 10 year or 20 year plans. This is not really possible in the United States because the leadership of the studio has changed. It's like, oh, this, you know, this, yeah. once again, this sort of pesky democracy meritocracies are just getting in the way of getting your ridiculous film about someone who has to fight his way out of somewhere made. And listen, the justification that all these actors would give and lots of sports stars uh, would give is is better to engage with Saudi Arabia than not engage with Saudi Arabia. Oh, bullshit. Um, it's better... Well, listen, I'm just giving the <laughs> devil's advocate. Uh, it's better to think of Saudi Arabia in 20 years more liberal than it is now than less liberal than it is now. It's better to have a big, stable, cultural powerhouse somewhere in the Middle East. This is what they are able to say, you know, all the way from Lee Westwood, the golfer. And I, I, don't, I don't know if I believe you, Lee. Uh, I don't know if the liberalisation of the Middle East is your key concern. I take all of my cues on this from Lee Westwood. You know, from famously the most sort of liberal town in America, Hollywood, where, you know, everyone's up in arms about everything at all times. Fascinating to see the shapes that people... It's, you know, I'm sure that people in Hollywood hold their values and beliefs very dearly but they also <laughs> I know that was literally just an absolutely unfiltered laugh uh, but I think they hold the desire to get their film funded but their number one dearly. belief is in money so yes. they're, they're not that's the thing that makes all the other decisions they don't have to compromise their beliefs because in um this is literally this is nothing to do with movies um, I'm going to go back from screen washing to sports washing yeah the snooker which as you know is one of my greatest passions yeah as one of the few things I really get het up about now they're messing with snooker uh, and NBA has gone cross. too far uh, they've got a tournament out there where there's a special golden ball on the table which if any player scores a one four seven they get to try and pot that golden ball for an extra 20 points. They go, it'll be the largest break ever made in snooker history. Uh, it'll be a one six seven. No one's ever seen it before. You think, yeah, because you've had an extra ball that's worth 20 points. <laughs> of course someone's done it before, but you get half a million pounds if you Is do it. Is it a solid gold ball that you should... Surely it should be a solid gold ball that you get to keep. Oh, that's I don't a know what really that's worth. good idea. I think you'd get a kick, though, probably. Yeah. I think it, I, th- I think probably the gold would not run along the cushion quite also, as well. Also, when as... they take it away from you at the end and say, yeah, we just say that for the cameras, you, you going to say anything out loud? Just, no, thanks. Just take me to the airport. Thanks very much. I'll be off. Yeah, but I, listen, I look forward to Sean Murphy getting a 167. It's, uh, but listen, I mean, it's this is not a story that's going away. Um, MBS is not going to get this influential. There will be big, big movies that are uh, that are funded by Saudi Arabia. Keep an eye out for that title card, which will say the Red Sea Film Initiative or things like that. You're going to start to see yes. it. And also any number of umbrella organisations beneath that. Well, that's it. And it's, it's important to say that whatever title a company has, whatever title a fund has, they are all tied into the sovereign wealth fund. They're all tied into the ruling family. Yeah. If anyone wants to justify what they're doing, they have to accept that that's where their money's from. And by the way, and sports stars have pointed this out, and I'm sure movie stars will, there's always been very dodgy money from very bad places in sports. Yes, and, of course. And in Hollywood. Yeah. It's, it's just this one seems to be a lightning rod where you can you can jump one side or the other. And the hypocrisy is sort of even greater because, of course, most of these fa- films offend about 100 of their indecency laws. Yeah, I think it's probably a good rule of thumb. If your movie is funded by a country where when your film would be, be unable to be shown, <laughs> then, then, then maybe you should look for your money elsewhere. Mm. But they won't. We talk about the overnights, TV overnights, quite a lot. So I just thought we'd look through this week's top 100 shows and see if there's any interesting stories about what it is we are watching as a country, anything unexpected. Biggest show in Britain? 
last week, Call the Midwife. Three of the top four shows in Britain, Call the Midwife, Death in Paradise, Antiques Roadshow. You know, whatever we're talking about on Twitter, it is not those three shows, right? No, Sunday night is massive. Yeah, Sunday night and and just sort of big mainstream drama. By the way, they're getting about five and a half, five million, those shows. And 15 years ago, they'd be getting 16, 17 million. They'll be... And there'll be more on catch up. We should say that because people are not. People are often saying, "Oh, look, this show's viewership's fallen away, or whatever." But it hasn't necessarily because they people watch on catch up. Yes, this is pure overnights. Funnily enough, catch up usually follows the path of what the biggest show is. Absolutely. Anyway, it's very rare that a show would get one million and suddenly seven million people watch on catch up. But if there's a show like Gladiators that's up against Anton Dick's Saturday Night Takeaway, both of those shows will do very well on catch up. By the way, Gladiators beat Takeaway this week for the first time. I saw that. Which is a terrifying prospect for ITV yeah. uh, and, and, and a wonderful prospect for Nitro and Legend by the way House of Games uh, booking news we have a gladiator I can't tell you who's going to be oh my god yeah we have a gladiator there's been a lot of chat about which gladiator a lot of them were up for it uh, but yeah we have uh, you we, have your first gladiator we have let's our put it first, that way your yeah, first gladiator yeah but it's gladiator ready <laughs> uh, I can't wait to be saying that so it's interesting that right at the top of those ratings are shows that aren't really in the cultural conversation no that's not super unexpected but interesting but what is really fascinating look at the, looking at the top 100 is what's happened to the soaps now EastEnders Corey Emmerdale used to absolutely dominate. They used to get 20 million. They were just complete behemoths. Plot lines would be on the front of the tabloids. Uh, Tony Blair, when Deirdre Barlow, do you remember when Deirdre Barlow was falsely imprisoned? (laughs) Um, And Tony Blair talked about it in the House of Commons. Yeah, well, quite Obviously right. He didn't watch the show. He just was told to say that. So, but it, but it doesn't matter. It it's it was it was a big enough for to, yeah. to have to make but comments you know what? about it. He got stuff done. Yeah, is she still in prison? No, she's not. No, she's Listen, not. Listen, at some point we've got to reassess his legacy. <laughs> uh, sorry to go, all <laughs> Alistair Campbell, there for a second. Um, they put a lot into it, put huge amounts of money into the sets and, and what have you. Eighty nine million that new set for, for EastEnders. EastEnders. I mean, God. Um, in that top hundred, the highest episode of EastEnders is in position 64. You're kidding. That's 2.3 million viewers. Gosh. Again, it will get more on catch up, yeah. but 2.3 million overnight. That's not that's lower than the one show, it's lower than all sorts of things, you know. It's not a great rating. It's it's properly on its knees. Um Coronation Street slightly better, 3 3 and a half million, but still only in 15th, still gets the same as Michael McIntyre's The Wheel. Yeah. Um Emmerdale again 3.4. So EastEnders is in the biggest trouble. You know that thing of, I always remember my Nan's remote control, the one and the three were, yeah. were uh, completely worn out. Worn out. Yeah, yeah. And, and people go, no, but people don't really mind what channel things are on. 97 of that top 100 shows are on BBC One or ITV. Yeah. Okay, there's one Channel 4 show, Gogglebox, uh, and there's two BBC Two shows, University Challenge, and uh, hold on, let me look. Richard Osman's House of Games is the other one there. <laughs> that is, uh, sorry, I'm just checking my... Sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. Richard Osman's House of Games, sponsored by Visit Riyadh. Um, <laughs> so that's where the mainstream of our culture is in but those top 100 shows. it's interesting because we talk about different things and I think it's worth talking about reach. Yeah. Was, I remember uh, last summer I interviewed um, Jesse Armstrong on stage. He's the, he's the man behind Succession, he's the man, he, Peep Show. Succession, and, yeah. Peep Show, all these things. And yet he said, most of my shows I've made are not very high rating at all. And we moved on. We talked about other things, but it's interesting that he, his shows, which have had, I mean, you think of the sort of full spectrum cultural purchase of the final season of Succession, where everyone is talking about absolutely everything. There are a million think pieces about it. Also, things like Peep Show or the thick of it or whatever. But these are not kind of mega mega rating things. No. And yet they, whereas things that are often very high rating, sort of nobody talks about, and they don't seem to have the hold. And I suppose, I know you want to come on to GB News. That's quite an interesting one where you have this kind of the tension between reach and viewership. And I think that's interesting. So Yeah, but between signal and noise. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I, I genuinely think if, if you're interested in politics in this country, and quite often you talk to politicians, if you don't understand that Britain is called the midwife and death in paradise and antiques yeah. roadshow... Uh, Country file, which is also in the top yeah. ten. That's who is voting in this country. Okay, that's who's voting, and every single bit of noise around politics in this country is about completely different groups of people. 
not in the top 100 because of the, 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 the way it's measured, but often the biggest show on TV every single night, takes an awful lot to beat it, is local news. Yeah. The BBC local news at 6.30 in your area, you add them together, that's the biggest show in the area. That's Britain. That's what Britain are watching. And that's what millions of Britons are watching, which is the thing that's important for elections. So the local news is a is a is a huge success story. I often say to my publishers when they talk about putting you on TV shows to promote books, I said, sit me on local news. I said, that's that, yeah. that's where everyone's watching. And that's where people who buy books are watching. You know, that's the that's the thing. And yeah, so I thought I'd look at um GB News. We'll have it your way. We'll no. have it Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. Lois. The biggest show on GB News, as you say, it has huge cultural cachet. We hear about almost nothing else. It's one of the, you know, if you looked at column inches for TV channels, it's right up there, you know, behind the big terrestrials. The biggest show, the first, the, the three biggest shows, in fact, are, are Farage's show, which is on at 7 p.m. Uh, and the biggest rating of last week was 126,000. Okay, 126,000 people watching that. To give you an idea of that, a repeat of As Time Goes By, the old Jeffrey Palmer, Judy Dench sitcom on drama was getting 275,000. So double, double, okay? Now, this is not to denigrate GB News, by the way. We did a um, we did a big industry news quiz this week where everyone gets together for charity, and GB News did unbelievably well. Well, they are... <laughs> they, 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 thrashed my, they thrashed my team. But they're 400 percent increase year on year in viewership they want to be the biggest news channel by 2028 and i think they will be but here's the I'm key i'm sorry to say whether or not you love it but it, it, this is the case but here's the key if you're setting up a tv channel the hardest thing to do is to um market it right you'd have to spend so much money i mean firstly again they're they don't have to worry about turning a profit because there's people with deep pockets behind them who have their own reasons for, you know, wanting to fund GB News. But that is a that is a very, 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 very small rating. What they really are in lots of ways is a kind of, and they've said this themselves at certain different times, is that they're a sort of digital business with a TV station attached. And when we talk about marketing, you know, I remember at the time I was asked to write a thing about the opening night show you know when they launched and I I knew that you know essentially you know in a way what you're being asked to do is say this is rubbish it's all really nothing's going to happen and I thought I don't want to do that because I think there is a market for this yeah. I think it could get quite big and I, I'll just wait and see how it goes now in some ways, and this is not a conspiracy theory saying that they deliberately didn't have any lighting and everything fell apart on the first night on purpose, but you can't pay for marketing. Mm. Everybody wrote articles about it. People were like, oh, look, you know, the, um, the everything goes wrong in their studio. You can't see anybody. People are sort of looking wrong against the green screen. It's, it, it's a complete fiasco. The production values are so low. They kept saying this for about, you know, months. They kept saying this. But that just meant there are lots of stories out there about GB News. So it becomes something that's recognised. And I'm afraid people see clips. By the way, Ofcom is investigating Ofcom, which is the regulatory body for um, the media, which is investigating them on about, I think, about 11, 12 issues of impar impartiality breaching. They are there's plenty of things that sort of going wrong and that are being allowed to go wrong. Um, and they obviously are employing many, many people from the governing party in British politics, which is yeah. another big issue. But they are a success story and. What I was, what they've, one of the ways they've done it is by not paying people very much money. You see what they can get compared to what you might get as an anchor mm -hmm. on another channel. They don't pay people very much money, which is what Talk TV went wrong, where they're playing sort of Piers Morgan's like fifty million pounds I mean, over three years. I mean, the what single a, worst deal in the history of television, an apart unbelievably from, apart bad from deal. For Piers Morgan, it, who was really, it was the single best deal in the history, in the history of, British of television. television, and is now over and is going to YouTube. Well, yeah, um, because he got fifty million. So, what does he care? What's the difference? I mean, literally, I mean, he's not going to. Why? why See what they're getting on GB News because half the MPs have to declare it, and it's not very much by the standards of the industry. It's about two hundred quid an hour, or yeah, something. Yeah, it's not. It's Lee really Anderson, not very much. Nice, but yeah, as as you say, it's it, it, on a. If Lee Anderson was a news anchor on a different channel, he would. Yeah, yeah, he'd be getting a lot more. But that's the way to make it work within our market, the US market, where you get 
people who get paid a lot to be on Fox News. I mean, it's a massive market, amount. though. It's a huge, it's a huge, it's a big country. There are obviously just a better sort of, you know, it's that's to yeah. do with scale. I mean, we have a much on, smaller country, yeah. and we are much less polarized in general. So within that, you, they have, but they have cut their cloth according to that, and they pay, they don't pay people very much. They're good on digital, and they are becoming a massive. They are becoming a success story. I mean, they're hugely in the middle of our culture, and the numbers just don't back it up in any way. I mean, I, I can't begin to tell you how lower rating some of those shows get. It's a news channel, so they often get low ratings. But, but, it but just, their clip, the clips on social media get seen by loads of people I and it know, doesn't really... I don't even buy that stuff. You know, there's so many kind of auto plays and auto counts and all that kind of stuff. Whenever someone tells me they've had a million views for something, I think, well, I mean, I don't think you have. No, I'm sure they haven't, but they are on. They are increasing where other people are falling away. They've increased four hundred percent in their in in their viewership, and they they are on track. I don't at think the they have increased four hundred percent in their viewership because their viewership must have been almost non-existent for it, I mean, year on year. They have increased three hundred ninety-four percent. No. Yes. Peak, I'm, yes. Really? Yes. I'm afraid to tell you they have. I don't think because they were getting one hundred and fifty thousand for shows last year. Well, they were year. getting, but they're they're the fastest growing news website. But I think if anyone's thinking about the next election and people being influenced and all this kind of stuff, I always think, you know, my mum gets the Daily Mail every day because she likes playing code word. Right? <laughs> if you said to her that's a right-wing paper, she wouldn't have a clue because she's not reading the mm. politics bits of it. But if, even if you take the biggest rating of the week on GB News, which is, let's say, 126,000, that is fewer than 200 people per constituency in Britain. OK, it's not a huge amount of people, whereas if you look at Call the Midwife, that's 14,000 people in every constituency in Britain. That's where Britain is. So the reason I wanted to talk about ratings really, so if I can conclude in some way, it is sort of this, which is an awful lot of people are using a very, very small base to leverage themselves into very, very big cultural figures. And I'm monetizing that as well. I'm making a huge amount of money uh, out of it. And so I would just say sometimes if you're doom scrolling or you're getting furious about someone or something, you don't need to talk about them because everybody is watching Call the Midwife. And to put 126,000 into even more perspective in terms of politically engaged people, the rest is politics is getting about 700,000 downloads per episode. Uh, and, and no Ofcom complaints, none at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And no one's accusing them of uh, having any impact on the next election. <laughs> I get all my politics from the rest is football. If Michael Richards comes out for the Lib Dems, that's where I'm voting. <laughs> genuinely fascinating article by a man who writes under the name The Honest Broker. He starts with this idea that entertainment ate art, right, which means people were making Marvel movies instead of The Godfather. Look at the mask of my boy. He then says that distraction ate entertainment, oh, which yeah. is that looking, for, looking at something for 15 seconds is better than a Marvel movie and that constant endless kind of cycle. And now his final bit of his uh, thesis is that addiction is eating distraction. And he calls the big technology companies a dopamine cartel. And essentially, we've all been sort of, we've all been brought into this system of constant rewards every 15 seconds. And that that's where all the money in entertainment is now. Well, I think it's, and I think it's, it's fascinating. It's a sort of cultural state of the nation, he calls it. And I, one of the things, you know, many people will say, gosh, you know, I'm I'm reading an article and I can't concentrate to the end because I have to post on social media to say this is a really good article, and many people sort of understand that. And for you know, also for a while, it felt. I mean, while Donald Trump was president, it felt like the world was being run off one of these platforms, which mm. is a sort of dopamine churn. And there's this stimulus, and you respond to it, and then something else comes along every 15 seconds. So we're getting these culture or whatever it is, is coming in 15 se second little bursts and you need another one and another one and another one. And what they want is for you to stay on their platform. Now, yeah. this is a very sort of basic thing is that these people want you to stay on their platform. This is why when you go on Twitter X, as it is now, is it's really hard now. The algorithm is sort of burying oh. articles about, you know, linking to an article that you're suggesting that people read. You say, have a look at this. It's really interesting. It's really hard to click through now. And that's because 
if you click through to that article, you're not on Twitter anymore. Yeah. You're not on X anymore. Uh, they don't want you off the platform. They want you to stay on the platform. The best thing that you can do on the platform is to be angry. They want you angry because the long the angry people, it is proven, stay longer on their platforms. There's a fantastic book by a guy called Jaron Lanier called um, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, and it's about 100 pages. It's absolutely terrific. Oh, I read that on Twitter. It's <laughs> yeah. Also, Shoshana Duboff, who wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism, this is what they want. They want you to stay on the platform so they can use your data and they will get to know you better and ultimately they will be able to sell your data to people who will sell some other things to you. They know how toxic this is. All sorts of scientific papers, yeah, talk, talking about what it does to the brain, right? That, 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 yes, that people have become completely addicted. They can't leave their phones and it's making them... Unhappy, it's causing something that is called anhedonia, which is Ted Gerald is very good about. Which is, you know, when you can't take pleasure in things that you're continually doing, there's a form of ennui where you're not enjoying any of this. It's incredibly flattening, yet they will not do anything to deal with it because they want to keep you on the platform. They'll lose that to other members of the dopamine cartel. Yeah. And one of the things that I find really sort of depressing about it is. All of these things that they're doing, so many of the innovations, people are wondering, like, why is Google trying to do driverless vehicles? I'll tell you why. Because Americans, disproportionately compared to Europe, spend a huge amount of time in their cars. When you're in your car, you're not on the platform. Now, in terms of what it means for what we're talking about on this podcast, like entertainment, art, all those things, it's terrible because it's 15 seconds of gobbits. It's nothing. Creative people that I know are just really creative people are just not on these platforms. I am, of course. Um, but I... Uh... <laughs> no. I and, get it. and some people Marina, say, do you think I it helps it. you though? Listen, does it help you? Do, you it may have help to, you, you sell have to tell your me work. somehow. You, do you think, does it inspire you? Um, I think that, so I buy this thing about the dopamine cartel. I genuinely do. And I think like the tobacco industry in the 50s, they know about it as well. They know what they're doing. They know. Yeah, but they, they just don't of, care. Well, I always think it's funny in those sort of businesses. Culturally, everything. Everything there is set up for them not to care. Everything there is set up for them to kind of go, oh, no, this just, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it. But just don't forget we've got the next six months results. You know, everything in capitalism is about, you know, your earnings call in six months' time or what your earnings call for the year. So it's very, very short-term uh, thinking, uh, which at least is apt. Uh, and so it's quite hard to turn those things around. So I suspect there are people that the people there have left, for sure, because they think they're doing wrong. There's people there who've left and said, my children are never going on these um, platforms because they know they're doing wrong. Uh, and there will be people there in the trenches who in 10 years' time will be going, what was I doing? Like, I'm sure you know good people who worked at the tabloids many years ago who you now look back at what the tabloids were doing. They just go, I, I guess I did know. I guess I did. But honestly, my day-to-day -day life was not that. It was just speed and let's get this done. And, you know, so I, th I think there's some kind of deniability for people who, who work in those things. But they know what they're doing. I think it suits my personality type because I have a very low attention span anyway. So culture has come towards me. Can I talk a little bit about this? Going back to this business of distraction and all of that, I have spoken to quite a few. I've, and during the writer's strike, a lot of showrunners and people talked about these sort of things. Um, and even Justine Bateman, who's an actress and now a writer, said she had said she'd heard from so many showrunners who were given notes by the streaming channels that they say, this isn't second screen enough. Mm. And what they mean is the viewer is expected to be on their phone kind of half doing something else while your crime drama or whatever is playing. And you just can't make it as complicated as you have because they're not going to understand it because they're only going to be half concentrating on your show. I mean, when you think how much it costs to make one of these things and what you're saying is, yeah, you're sort of competing with someone's social media account and you're going to be, they're going to have half an ear and half an eye on you. They're going to watch you with subtitles and please you've got to have to repeat the story and the key plot details several times so that they definitely get them. That is super depressing. And it's interesting, in the response to Chet Ted Giola's, um article, I've noticed he's sort of gone back and said, gosh, I've got a really big response to this. There were teachers writing in saying, I've got children leaving the classroom saying they have to go to the bathroom. They No, they haven't. It's just that they cannot get through the lesson without looking at their phone. They just can't concentrate. Well, it's destroyed it, concentration. That's where the addiction thing comes in. I have nothing against shorter form entertainment. I have nothing against funny clips. I've, you know, there's some absolutely brilliant stuff out there. Uh, also, by the way, culturally, we do still have 
Oppenheimer and Barbie. You know, we do. We are capable still of concentrating. Yeah, but will we but, be? It's that is going really fast. You know, we were we were peak TV. Now the strikes are over. We're going to halve the amount of scripted. So yeah, but we're we're, we're halving and and in the we're biggest halving glut an enormous amount. Yes, I agree. <laughs> the, in, and they had the to race for scale, and they all had yeah. to race to win and what have you. But you know, clearly the movie studios are in trouble. Clearly, entertainment in general. I think that is. We need to think about it being an addiction. I really, really yeah. do. So, and lots of kids. By the way, lots of people aren't addicted to it, but lots of people are addicted to it. Um, and I think that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as the years go by. And how can a government legislate? You, you can't because these tech companies are so much bigger than governments, and they're so much but more. But none global of them are than, too big to fail. Governments. They could. Many of them could be broken up and regulated better. Honestly, if they collapse tomorrow. What, tell me, tell me what the sort of destruction of you know you're not going to bring the world's economy to collapse. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if one of them goes. And you know if Twitter part, falls by the wayside, something else will come up. I'm sure. But it doesn't. No one is too big for, to fail in the tech companies. Well, that's what I think culturally. I think by and large, culture tends it's it's a it's a pendulum and it goes it goes back into the opposite direction when it goes far enough. And I do think there's a whole generation of artists who are going to. Of course, there's a generation of artists who'll be coming through who make super fast, hyper quick stuff because that's what excites them, is what they like. But there will also be a generation who go, oh, hold on, I can go and watch an actual film. I can read a book. You know, I think it's fascinating that anyone listening to this now is listening to a podcast, which is essentially two people talking for 40 minutes. You know, culturally, books are getting bigger and bigger. Podcasts are getting bigger and bigger. It's only things like film, which are incredibly expensive, that are having trouble. But they'll find a way of making those things cheaper as well. I think, I think culturally, things move in different directions. But I do think scrolling is like smoking uh, and at some point we're going to have to do something to uh, to, to deal with that yes I, we, I think we should thank people for watching this clip on their device oh that'd be nice see. Um, that's us done isn't it that is us done we yeah. will be back on Thursday and can I say by the way questions edition sometimes I think there's there, there's a bit of doom saying but um, you know we're all we're listening to podcasts we're having a good time you know we still listen to the stuff we love. We still watch the stuff we love. There's still brilliant stuff being made by brilliant people out there. So I would say we are the fight back. Everyone listening, us, we're part of, you know, <laughs> a thing to say we want to save our culture and we want to Absolutely. make great things and great content and all that kind of stuff. So I, the war is not lost, I will say. Oh, no, no, I'm not for one second do I think that, but I do think it's significant to guard against people and to guard against kind of essentially malevolent actors, which I think some of these big companies are. I'm afraid that you had to do that within 3.4 seconds, you did it in 4.1, so pe <laughs> people switched off just before the end. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday for see our question and answer one. We've got some great questions this week.